happy to welcome um, Eric Medlin. Eric and I have been talking about this book, I think, for three years, I guess. Uh, on and off, yeah. yeah it's, been, um, it's been a while. And so Eric is uh, a scholar and a professor at Wake Tech, and um, he sort of got into this, um, and he'll I think he'll probably talk about this, and it's something we've talked about, is because there's really no good history of the furniture industry in North Carolina. And if any of you have been around, like, like Richard Wood, you've been around here for a while, you know, you know, you know the history of High Point's furniture industry, but actually it's not really well written down anywhere, to be honest. Um, if you want the history of the furniture industry, you basically have to come to the High Point Museum. In High Point, you have to come to the High Point Museum. So Eric uh, has this really nice book, and we hope you'll pick up a copy of it. It's really interesting. And he talks about a lot of things that are not high point focused, more about the industry in North Carolina as a whole, which as being here at High Point Museum, I found very interesting. There was a lot of stuff that I, I didn't know. So I know he's gonna talk about some of that today. So I'll let Eric go ahead, take it away. Thank you very much right. for coming, we appreciate it. Thank you so much, Marion. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you, Susie. Thank you to everybody at the High Point Museum for welcoming me here and being so kind to me, giving me this space, giving me a lapel microphone. I've never had one of these before. <laughs> they had to, had to set it up and put the wire through your shirt. I was amazed. Uh, it was very interesting. Okay, so for a show of it, uh, just, just for my personal information, um, and to, to understand my audience a little bit more. Show of hands, who at some point in this room has been in the furniture industry? Okay, let Facebook and Instagram show that nearly every hand went up. <laughs> I think there's like a cluster over here where no hands went up, but I think it was I about- all my favorites. 80. <laughs> I wasn't in it long. Oh uh, yeah, it happened. About 85, 90% probably. So this was the perfect place to have a presentation like this. So I'd like to thank everybody for coming. Um, after I finish my presentation, I'm going to be uh, answering questions, any questions that you have, and then I'll be signing books in the back. And I'll be around for a little while to answer any questions if you want to come up. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm a North Carolina native. I'm from this little, nothing little town called Creedmoor, North Carolina. I went to UNC Chapel Hill for my undergrad, and I went to grad school at NC State. Uh, when I was at Chapel Hill and at NC State, I studied things that were totally different from North Carolina. I studied British history for a little while and, and the history of uh, New York historians. And then when I graduated, I started working with some historians in the Raleigh area, and they said, you really need to get into North Carolina history got into North Carolina history, and was looking for something to write about, and my friend and mentor, Mike Hill, at the State Archives said, you know what, Eric, uh, you want something to write about, you should write a history of the North Carolina furniture industry because there's never been one. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. Because <laughs> when I was in eighth grade North Carolina history class, everybody who's in here who went to school in North Carolina, you learn, okay, North Carolina industry, you have tobacco, you have textiles, and you have furniture. And tobacco, there are tons and tons and tons of books about the tobacco industry, tons of books about the textile industry, and there never really had been an actual history of the furniture industry throughout the state. There have been books about individual companies, things like closing and factory man, individual people, but never a, a general survey history. So then I decided, that I needed to solve that problem. Started writing this book, started out in the state, and then went on to the lovely people at the University of Georgia Dallas, which is who or who published this book. So I'm gonna get into the furniture industry. I'm gonna compare with the textile industry. I'm gonna talk a little bit about why there had never been a history of the furniture industry. I think it really, a preview of that answer is, I think it really comes down to the fact that uh, historians have not felt comfortable understanding furniture as antiques and as pieces of art and understanding different types of furniture, you know, understanding it from an aesthetic perspective. And then people who understand furniture, like dealers and designers, don't know the history. 
So nobody had really combined. Okay, so I'm going to start off very early on in North Carolina history because North Carolina furniture industry goes way, 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 way back. North Carolina furniture industry began, like many other basic industries in the state, with the arrival of British settlers to North Carolina. These settlers reached the northeast part of the state, Albemarle Sound, in the mid-1600s, displaced a number of Native American groups, and began to build houses, towns, and government buildings. They faced an early need for furniture, which they mostly built on their own. Carpenters and specialists emerged in the first few decades with early apprenticeship records dating from the 1690s. By the early 18th century, artisans in the coastal plain were producing high quality pieces. Let's see if the clicker works. The clicker doesn't work. Okay. Like this. This is a combination desk and bookcase, one of the earliest produced in the Southern colonies. This piece was created by a man named Lawrence Sarson, a local cabinet maker who was born in England and arrived before 1720. The Mesda collection in Old Salem is full of pieces like this, many from the Roanoke River Basin, but also from eastern towns like Rich Square in Edenton. You know, High Point eventually becomes the, the capital of the North Carolina furniture industry, but for a few decades, the capital of the North Carolina furniture industry really arguably could have been Rich Square. If anybody here has ever been to Rich Square, tiny, tiny, tiny little town outside of Wilson. Well, closer to, maybe closer to uh, Roanoke Rapids, Halifax, uh, uh, Jackson area. And that was just where the artisan lived. That was where a handful of cabinet makers came together, ended up living there. Uh, one actually uh, uh, inherited some land and Ended and produced lots of high quality furniture pieces. This furniture piece amazes me and a lot of other pieces at the Mesda Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts collection. They amaze me because if you look at houses in, from North Carolina from the, this time period, none survived from the 17-teens. And there's one from the 1720s and it's small. And some of the other houses and, and pieces of art from that time are very crude and basic. So the fact that cabinet makers can put together something this beautiful is really amazing. Throughout the 1700s, the industry begins to move west with the arrival of German and Scots Irish immigrants. Places such as the Catawba River Valley and Old Salem produced a number of medium and high quality pieces. Why so many of these pieces have been the Mesda? The North Carolina furniture industry at this time was considered the work of fine cabinet makers who built for the highest levels of society. Some planters and state leaders, like John Motley Moorhead, ordered their furniture from abroad or up north. All the furniture in Glenwood, if you ever go to downtown Greensboro, that furniture was, was a, the furniture in that house was originally from, from up north. But many others used local cabinet makers, most famous of which was, of course, Thomas <coughs> Day. This is a Thomas Day chair. Many of you have heard of Thomas Day. His pieces adorned a number of triad area houses, most notably those in his adopted town of Milton. That little scroll on the arm of the chair is kind of a Thomas Day staple. Day's style was a beautiful Gothic inspired approach that became known for its curves, scrolls, and flourishes. He was one of the first cabinet makers to embrace steam powered machinery such as saws, which helped carve out his intricate Day was also a free black artisan at a time when North Carolina's free black population was vastly limited in economic opportunity. Like many other successful cabinet makers, Day owned enslaved laborers who worked in his shop. A number of free black men and women bought slaves simply to set them free at this time period, but there's no evidence that Day saw his enslaved laborers as anything more than cheap labor, an unavoidable stain on his legacy that he shares with a number of other antebellum southern this is a debate that has happened with Thomas Day and Thomas Day's legacy for probably about the past century. It goes back and forth on the importance of slavery to Thomas Day's workshop. A number of historians have gotten involved and his own descendants have gotten involved. Furniture industry, as we've discussed, remained small and was decimated by the Panic of 1857 and the Civil War. The Panic of 1857 ran Thomas Day for the business. He died soon. Following the war, a new industry grew up, the industry that we know today as the furniture industry. 
This industry was based on a number of factors. One being machinery. Machinery had been introduced and perfected in areas like Grand Rapids. There, was, there were also New South boosters who brought capital and positive press to their activities. They could use cheap stands of wood and similarly cheap labor from the Western Piedmont. And finally, these new companies had a number of new railroad connections built during the 1860s and 1870s to transport their products to new textile mill villages, which were in desperate need of new furniture. Where this textile industry is coming up at about the same time, places like Charlotte Conway. All of these factors came together where, of course, High Point in the 1890s. This is a picture of High Point from one of those uh, one of those boosters. The town was a prototypical boom town, like Manchester or Detroit. New businesses popped up overnight, and the population doubled in a few short years. In that time, the town had banks, steel frame urban buildings, and neighborhoods of stately homes built in the craftsman style, which I'm sure you're driven by Main Street. The town had its own voice of the New South in J.J. Ferris, editor of the High Point Enterprise. He was the, the Henry Grady, or the Daniel Tompkins of the furniture industry. And High Point, even by the early 1900s, was known across the country as the next Grand Rapids. The High Point approach to furniture was copied time and again throughout the state, from western cities like Marion to Piedmont towns like Lexington. At this time, the furniture industry was not relegated to the furniture belt, and a number of outliers existed. These outliers, like those of the early textile industry, helped show alternative paths forward for furniture in the state. So in the textile industry, the first centers of the textile industry were not Concord or Charlotte. They were places like Lincoln and Rocky Mount, just places where these factories ended up. And then other factors ended up taking over over time and concentrating the industry in these particular areas. And that happens with the furniture industry. 1890s, there's of course High Point, but major centers of the furniture industry are Dunn and Goldsboro and Greensboro and Salem, Asheville, and Charlotte. Uh, all of these places have those factors that I talked about. They've got they've got transportation, they've got railroad connections. Places like Goldsboro's got tons of railroads. They've got cheap wood everywhere. Eastern North Carolina full of cheap wood, but things like tobacco end up gaining prominence, especially in the eastern towns. And then textiles in Charlotte can run the furniture industry. There was even a high-end furniture shop as early as 1905. We're talking about furniture being cheap. We'll get into that. Furniture throughout much of North Carolina is cheap, but even in those early years, there's nice furniture. And here I'm talking, of course, about White's furniture. Weiss furniture begins in Mebane and soon produced pieces for the American Canal Zone as well as famously the Grove Park Inn. North Carolina's earliest furniture industry had a few defining characteristics, which I'm sure many of you know. Furniture in produced was cheap and made of wood, had to get into those textile factories. It was sold in bulk and mainly shipped to the textile towns of the Piedmont. Factories were built within the town limits on railroad lines with steam power used from the very beginning. Wages were low, but not as low as other <clears throat> industries, and factories were often owned and ran by local entrepreneurs. These characteristics help to distinguish furniture from the state's most important industry, which is, of course, textiles. This is the Luray Cotton Mill in Gastonia, which is very famous in the history of North Carolina textiles, for reasons that I will get into. <clears throat> Textile factories were often located in factory towns where workers were isolated and paid in script from the company store. Factory towns come from the way that those early textile factories were powered. They were really dependent on water power. So you had to find where the river bends and, and the water goes really fast and you can have a, a, you can build a, a wheel and then harness the power. Well, if that's in the middle of nowhere, Alamance County, or the middle of nowhere, Lincoln County, that's where your mill goes up. So you have to build a little town around it, and the town, the company has a lot of power. Places like uh, Glencoe 
has is one of those really early mill villages and they've rehabbed their mill village. It's really it's a beautiful place. But it's kind of at this time, you know, in the middle of nowhere. So textile factories were in these isolated factory towns where workers were paid in script from the company store. Furniture factories, on the other hand, almost exclusively paid their employees in cash. And only one town in the state, Drexel, could be considered a classic factory town. Uh, Drexel was the exception. A lot of these other factories, because they were based on steam and later on electricity, you can have that pretty much anywhere. So they were built in very convenient places, like right smack dab downtown High, places like that. Domination by smaller companies and owners meant a closer connection between employees and employers. As a result, labor unions were weaker in the furniture industry than in tobacco and textiles. So the thing about, I talked about why has there never been a history of the North Carolina furniture industry? This is a thing about historians, and it's similar to pretty much everybody. Uh, historians love drama, and they love excitement, and they love thrills, and they love very clear examples of their themes. And so in the textile industry, this, this factory was the subject of a union drive by the communists in the 1920s. And the communists came in and they had this big union drive and there was a, a one of their leaders was a young woman who was a, a, a troubadour and she would go around singing cotton mills songs and then she was murdered and then there was a big trial and then the police chief was murdered and there was a trial and a guy went insane during the trial and they had to have another trial and it's just it's all things like that and it happens again and again and again it happens again in henderson later on in the 20th century and you can tell this really clear simple easy story you have good guys you have bad guys you have dramatic confrontations you have people who hate to work in these factories and then the furniture industry is a lot more complicated the furniture industry ends up joining the strike in the early 1930s, along with the hosiery industry in High Point. And they're, they're going on strike, and they're, they're picketing, and it's going really well, and then the furniture workers all leave. And, and the hosiery workers say, what's going on? Where are you going? We're striking. And the furniture workers say, well, we have market. <laughs> and we have, to, we have to get ready for market. And we've got all this work coming in, we're gonna make all this money, and, and it's all great. And then hosiery workers just feel totally abandoned. So things like that don't catch the historian's eye as much. And so that's kind of one of those things that is, in addition to just having something be historically significant, have it be important to lots of lives, you know, lead to, to congressmen and senators and all that. Sometimes you have some of these other factors that influence whether or not these books are actually. Soon, beginning in really the 19-teens and 1920s, the North Carolina furniture industry was reaching a place of substantial importance in the state's economy. The number of factories grew and began to move into higher quality areas of furniture. Factory owners and operatives throughout the western Piedmont and foothills became enormously wealthy. The business was so successful that factory owners became household names, like the Wrens and Coxes in High Point and the Finches in Thomasville political importance of the furniture industry it was mentioned by Governor Aycock in the early 1900s and then reinforced in 1908 when a furniture leader ended up being the Republican nominee for governor. In the 1920s, 19-teens, you have this movement to acknowledge the importance <laughs> of the North Carolina furniture industry with uh, roadside monuments. This really popular trend of roadside monuments. And so North Carolina has, of course, its roadside monuments to the furniture industry. There is the, the chest of drawers in, in High Point that was originally, of course, the home of the Chamber, Chamber of Commerce when it was known as the Bureau of Information. <laughs> Which is just a great, the first time I saw that, I was like, oh my goodness gracious, that's a great one. And, so, and then they end up, of course, uh, renovating it and putting the socks on to represent the hosiery industry. And then 
I'm sure you're familiar with the Thomasville chair. This is, of course, the second Thomasville chair. There's a cool mural in downtown Thomasville, if you ever go, of the first Thomasville chair. It looked a lot. <laughs> and that was built in the 1920s of wood and rotted. And a funny thing about the, uh, the, the original chair is that uh, they took it to the state fair right after they built it. And then it was stolen by <laughs> NC State students as a prank. And the NC State students ended up writing a lot of just obnoxious stuff about the president of NC State. And then they had to take it and fix it up. Uh, and and the, the president was apologizing for the terrible things. <laughs> so, and that's, and then it was, it brought in the, the, and it was rebuilt in the 50s. And that's the one that's there today, and the one that uh, Lyndon Johnson climbed into in the uh, <coughs> uh, presidential campaign. In the middle of the 20th century, furniture industry began to move once again. Now, of course, the furniture industry starts out in at, in, at a large scale in places like New York and Boston, then it moves west to Jamestown and New Grand Rapids in search of more wood, and cheaper labor. Well, then it moves again within North Carolina to a certain degree to Western North Carolina. It shifted West in a quest for cheaper labor and easy to access timber. Hickory and Lenore took market share from places like Thomasville and High Point. Those earlier centers began to shift to services with the phenomenal growth of the High Point market accelerating throughout the period. But throughout the 1960s, in the 1970s, the shift remained slow. North Carolina was still a manufacturing state. They were very proud of buildings like this. This is the, uh, the Broyhill headquarters uh, in Lenore. It's right off of the, the main highway. A huge, huge building, and would have been particularly large in a town like Lenore in 1960. 1960s, 1970s, shift to services is very slow. North Carolina was still a manufacturing state. And around this time, nearly one million people worked in the state's furniture industry. In addition to bringing prosperity to its historical employees, white male workers, the industry also expanded to give opportunity to black managers, entrepreneurs, and uh, other African-American <coughs> workers. Furniture was similar to textile and tobaccos, tobacco in that black workers were originally given menial jobs, such as tending boilers and hauling lumber. But spurred by public and governmental pressure, the industry began to strive for diversity. Several women took control of furniture firms, such as Kay Lambeth, and black entrepreneurs started their own companies. One notable example was a man on the right, David H. Wagner, a Davidson County native who began one of the first black-owned furniture factories in the nation in the 1970s. <coughs> his struggles with the Small Business Administration led to the ultimate downfall of his once prosperous <coughs> He had just this multi-year saga fighting with the Small Business Administration. They, they one of his business partners uh, went to the administrator and complained about him and, and they, they got off of his side. So very interesting person, uh, ended up being one of the earliest uh, black graduates from uh, Wake Forest Law School and started a bunch of businesses, started a restaurant, uh, built a bunch of <clears throat> the state furniture industry began its well-known collapse in the 1980s. It was sparked by a movement in the previous two decades while the industry was ascendant throughout the state. So what happened was national firms and national businesses started to notice that there were all of these furniture factories in North Carolina. They were very profitable. They were making a lot of money, but they were being run inefficiently and in these old-fashioned and so you started having new uh, newspaper articles, magazine articles, and business trade publications saying this is an investment opportunity. That is actually where the title of my book comes from, Fortune Magazine, article 1967. You can't understand furniture until you have your pockets filled with sawdust and your mouth full of tobacco juice. <laughs> That's what these local people are saying. They're saying you're not going to be able to run these companies unless you have a, a connection to the town, the connection to the city. And of course, that's what ended up happening. But for several decades, there was just money flowing. Large companies <laughs> like Armstrong Cork, Magnavox, and Burlington Industries started buying up local firms. Those factories had nothing tying them to local communities. 
During the Great Depression, firms would run at a loss and enforce pay cuts rather than closing plants. That, that was one thing that ended up hampering the unions. You would have stories about things like White's Furniture, White's Furniture, a union representative came to try to organize the company. They went to one of the workers. They said, we need to organize because of your terrible, terrible boss who we need to have more strength against. And they're like, I can't do that. Why not? Because my boss goes fishing with me every Sunday. <laughs> that is the small time, small companies. And what happened during the depression was they didn't want to fire their family members, they didn't want to fire their friends, they didn't want to fire people in the community. So they had pay cuts and they operated at a loss. But after becoming part of a multinational firm headquartered in some other state or even some other country, furniture factories were just another line on a balance sheet. Tariff reductions combined with a brief economic downturn led to hundreds of factories being closed over the past 30 years. One of the most notable, of course, being the original Drexel factory, which that's what it's like now. That's what? The, the original Drexel factory in Drexel. Um, a lot of these factories have been rehabbed, but nobody has gotten around to them. There, there is a, a, when you look at North Carolina changing, and I'm sure a lot of you who are familiar with the industry uh, know this already, I'm not telling you anything new, but you look at, at changes in the 1960s and 1970s and you say, oh, the country started moving towards services at that time, you have this long movement that happens. It's really not the case. In furniture, from what I've, I've talked to, you know, people at Century Furniture and Urban Lambeth, it really, it was all of these factors happened and then you had a recession or you had some big announcement or you had some big merger and then a factory close and then a bunch of factory close all at almost the same time. And so all of these factors that have been growing, you know, things like NAFTA and, and trade with China, create the circumstances for one little <coughs> recession, one little economic decline, and then the factory struggle. So that is the, the, the story of the basic story of furniture and the basic story of furniture factories that a lot of people are familiar with. But that is not everything, of course. Today, furniture has experienced a resurgence the furniture market is as large and successful as ever, attracting over 70,000 visitors a year. I, twice a year, twice a year. I went to the fall 2023 market and it was absolutely packed. It was an amazing experience. But you could see vibrancy, you could see new things, you could see lots of excitement in the furniture industry. The growth of High Point University has led to growing infrastructure to support the people and businesses who facilitate the, the furniture market. Factories themselves have weakened the power of the shipping container by offering high quality pieces that can be customized thousands of different ways. Something that I've learned talking to some of these manufacturers, and this is particularly true for upholstery, not as much for case goods, but for a long time, shipping containers, outsourcing were, were dominant, but then, these companies began to realize that a big, bulky, completely customizable couch doesn't fit with all the other things in the shipping thing. So it's a lot easier to, it's a lot more difficult to efficiently and cheaply ship that across the Pacific. And so domestic manufacturing can gain somewhat of an advantage. And that has led to this growth in furniture factories as profiled by the New York Times and other places these factories actually hiring, not laying people off, but having jobs and, and upping the pay on these jobs because the demand is so high. That is, of course, in addition to the design <coughs> function and the designers that are making millions of dollars in places like Thomasville. This is a uh, designer out of uh, Thomasville, one of his uh, uh, design for libraries and it can have, it's trying to build privacy when, you, when you're sitting in like a university. So can't outsource that very easily. Furniture industry 
will likely not reach its 20th century heights again. The country is focused on service industries and has only a niche role available for manufacturing. But consider what I've just said as opposed to something like textiles, which rose high, higher but fell further than furniture and has not found has not found a way forward, has not found a future, a way to break the shipping container. And then obviously tobacco is never going to be the same kind of industry that it was 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. But furniture manufacturers, designers, and marketers all continue to operate throughout the state, especially in High Point. They've begun opening new firms and taking advantage of opportunities made available by the COVID-19 pandemic. Furniture as an industry is alive. This is a happy story. And for the first time in 30 years, we can honestly say that its future, like its past, is looking bright. Thank you.